Good afternoon. I'm Anita Walker at the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and welcome to our inclusive exhibit webinar. This is all a part of our brand new program that we launched this year called UP, Universal Programs in Universal Places, where we're encouraging our nonprofit cultural organizations to incorporate universal design principles in their facilities, in their programs, in their websites, in every conceivable way so that Massachusetts can become the most inclusive and accessible place for the arts and culture on the planet. This afternoon we're going to be talking about strategies around making our exhibitions and exhibits as inclusive as they possibly can be. And we have a tremendous panel of experts sitting around the table here at the Mass Cultural Council. Um, part of the conversation today will be Hannah Goodwin, who is with the Museum of Fine Arts, Nora Nagel from the Museum of Science, and Emily Curran from the Old South Meeting House. And I have to tell you, we have been learning so much on our journey through the UP program here at the Mass Cultural Council. We have an innovation learning network, some of you I think are on the line, who have been meeting regularly, um, thinking about challenges that they want to address within their own organizations. They've all had user expert site visits where people with various barriers to participation have come and given them feedback on their organizations. And we've identified some topics that we think a lot of the fields could really benefit from being part of the conversation, and that's what we're doing here today. So I don't want to take any more time away from the great information that you're going to be getting. We've learned a lot um, really when we started this from among our guests, Hannah Goodwin at the Museum of Fine Arts. In fact, I think we took an early staff field trip over to the MFA with our board members and entire staff to just get our feet wet and finding out what this accessibility is all about so we can do our jobs better here at the MCC. So, Hannah. You do a lot of work at the MFA around making sure that every visitor who walks in the door has an opportunity to have a great experience. I try. <laughs> we try. <laughs> so before you before you get into some of the how tos and so forth, one of the things that we think about is not just the tactical components of it, but the culture of an entire organization. Talk about the MFA and how the whole organization in, is involved in um, an accessibility initiative. Sure, thanks. Um, so we do have the, uh, I think in some ways, the luxury of having a position that is dedicated um, to accessibility, but we really view it as uh, a team endeavor. And some of the things that we are doing and have done are um, to include access in our visitor service training and, um, and to keep training options open across the frontline staff as well as those kind of, I don't know, the next in, next in line, the next row out, um, in addition to, to training, uh, really looking at all the pieces of accessibility from uh, the physical space to a, a communications and information, and um, what the what the visitor experience is. Um, so. so talk about in an organization that's about visual arts. Um, what does accessibility mean, and how are you? What are some of the strategies that you're using? Um, well, that's a great question. Uh, definitely, as a visual art museum, we do have challenges. Um, that are not present in some other institutions, such as conservation, um, lighting, original works of art, things that are thousands of years old, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so the way that we are approaching it is to try to think about the components within a space that make that space as accessible and visitor friendly as possible and also the ways in which people can engage with the artwork and join in the different experiences in the museum. So our museum, I think like many museums, has a variety of ways in which we want to open up uh, the art to the visitors, so both kind of guided or museum-led options as well as self-guiding options and so to try to look at that whole really that whole range of what's happening and then what do we need to think about to make it accessible who is it easily accessible to who is it not and how do we kind of 
fill in those gaps. So imagine that you have an exhibition team that's working on the next big thing that's going to open up at the MFA. Talk about how you're involved, what you're looking for, what kind of influence you're going to have on that exhibition, what types of suggestions you might make. So, um, well, there's definitely the physical, the physical part of it. Um, we have tried to set standards for certain things. Um, we, we follow guidelines in terms of the, the height of things like cases, and, and when we have an exception to make, it, it's for a reason. You know, if something was in its original um, orientation intended to be six feet off the ground, then we will leave it six feet off the ground. Um, so we try to think about that part. We try to think about uh, the labels, the size of the font, the contrast. Um, we think about things like seating, try to provide a certain amount of seating throughout the museum. Um, so, so those kinds of things in terms of the physical access um, and then what it means for um, it, really anything from someone who may need to borrow a wheelchair because our museum is big to get around um, to a visitor who is blind. Um, who will benefit from description and things like that. Um, so is it really there, there are a whole bunch of different points that, that we try to think about and engage on and um, including, for example, the technology. I think one of the ways that we try to engage people throughout the museum is uh, through a mobile guide. And one of the things that we've done with that mobile guide is, is to try to make it as accessible as possible so that it has, um, ah, there we go. <laughs> so, um, so having, now there's a slide up, accessible foundation. So having that foundation, which we talked about, and um, part of that is looking at the basics and that I refer to in terms of the, the different things that we look at overall, and then some of it is looking at spe specific supports like someone not being able to walk long distances, someone needing uh, an assistive listening device, um, things like that. And I will say that, so that's what we aim for, and um, we, we don't get it right all the time. You know, I, I, do, I do not claim that there and then in every exhibition, there's as much seating as people would like, and you know, and so forth. But um, but the, that's the range of things that we we aim for. So continue on because you have some other slides to sure. come along with you. So sometimes so the slide that's up is um, it's kind of a dark slide. It's a little hard to see, but um, it's of our ancient coins gallery, and this is one of the. Uh, exhibitions where we really were able to do a little bit more and the exhibition designers, and I say we, but really it's the exhibition design team that um, looked at the, the task of making very small ancient coins accessible to a, anyone really coming through the museum and how would they have the opportunity to get up close, et cetera. And so they built these cases that have um, both magnifiers on them that you can move. They also have iPads so that you can flip the coin over and, um, and situated so that them so that they're wheelchair accessible as well. Um, so, so I like this. It's a nice solution. and. Are those uh, stools underneath that? There are, yeah, there are stools, so anyone can sit there, but they're also easily moved out of the way. Mm -hmm. So either it's, it's a child who doesn't want to sit, you know, it's kind of more their height, or so a wheelchair can pull underneath it. Um, then the, 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 the space is flexible underneath the cases. So. Um, this is one of my favorite actually <laughs> pieces of the museum, which is a collection of one-of-a-kind benches and chairs called Please Be Seated. Each is um, 
a, a unique piece of functional sculpture, really, by an artist. Uh, the two on the screen are, uh, one is um, called Glacier Bench. It's a piece made of cast glass. And the other, I think, is called Satie. Um, but they're in different parts of the museum. They are, anyone can sit on them, but they are also these pieces of art that are fun to touch. They're fun to explore. Um, it is. Uh, we use them sometimes on our tours for individuals who are blind, particularly for young people if it's their first visit to a museum. Um, and they also have been very popular with some young people um, with autism as, as objects that can be touched and explored. And um, anyway, I like that they kind of cross over uh, art and function. Uh, we try to offer things in an inclusive manner, and that, I think, is one of the big ways as an art museum we make the exhibits accessible, um, is to think about what kinds of ways we offer content to visitors. And so sometimes we have ASL interpretation, um, and sometimes we have tactile materials and things like that, and that they're part of uh, whatever is happening for all of the visitors and not um, just a specific audience. And one of the big things at the museum uh, in terms of self-guiding is that we have, uh, we have a mobile guide and in addition to audio and video, we have, we have used it to really try to create a platform that works for as many visitors as possible. So we have ASL videos, we have audio description, um, text transcript, there's closed captioning, and for people who use the audio description, they have a choice of using the guide as it is or choosing one that is on voiceover so that they use the screen reading program. And I think the piece of this actually that I'm the most excited about is that we didn't, um, that we approached it really fully. So the idea with the audio description is that um, all of the, all of the kind of quote unquote regular stops in English will have the audio description. So we haven't made it through the whole museum yet. But we're pretty far along so that hundreds, you know, really at this point, most, I think we're over half of the stops have audio description and that the American Sign Language is um, just one of our language spots. Mm -hmm. um, so it has the, same, has the same approach as Spanish or Russian or mm -hmm. whatever else we're doing and that the t text transcript is for anything that is, is spoken. So, um, so it's, it's a really nice tool for um, creating options for people who so Just to clarify, yeah. you said the text transcript mm -hmm. is for anything that's spoken. So there's captioning in any language as well? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I misspoke. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, so, so the English audio, the English audio comes up in text tra transcript. But not the other language. And no, we haven't figured that is something that would be great to figure yeah. out and we haven't figured that out. I was going to be amazed. Yeah. That. <laughs> That's why I'd ask. That was a good question. Sorry about that. And, and then we do have some specific programs. Um, so our, the, our philosophy is really embedded in choices for visitors, um, which runs across the board but is very much at the heart of, of accessibility at the museum. Um, so that someone who, well, I'll look at the, the two images on the screen. Um, the one on the left is a, actually it's a, the lid of an Etruscan sarcophagus that was being conserved. And the conservator ran a number of programs. Um, including some for individuals who are blind. So we partner, kind of my section, our section of the museum partner with the conservation to create this a program where people can learn about what's happening there in terms of conservation, 
um, but also to touch it while it is in a state where it can be touched. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the conservation, it's not going to be, yeah. So anyway, that was, that was really a lot of fun. But um, that's, that's a key point. You found the moment. We did, you yes. touch it yes. to allow that to, uh, right. to, to your visitor. That's great. And I mean, we have actually a lot of sculptures throughout the museum that can be touched with gloves and a guide, um, but not everything, you know. So yeah, we were we were lucky. We had, and and I think that is part of the team approach in the museum is that um, there are people, even if they're not directly connected to access, that are very much in support of the museum being accessible. So they'll come forward and say, hey. We're doing <laughs> such and such. But that they're thinking about it. Yeah. Not just they're thinking what the end product's going to be, but they're thinking, oh, here's a moment along the way. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Or they're open if approached. Yeah. You know? And then on the um, other, in the other picture, um, there is uh, a group in front of, it's one of our special exhibitions, um, Alex Katz. And um, there is a group of individuals who have memory loss and dementia. And they're having a guided tour, and uh, these tours are multi-sensory. And sometimes the the tour guides have a lot, you know, of fun and add in some different things. In this case, they're all matching the artwork. They were all dressed in colors <laughs> that were similar to the artwork. Um, so, in a program like that, is it brings people in who might not get to kind of stroll into the museum and drop in on a tour or something like that. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to access the art and also I think about them a bit as a bridge program. It, it builds um, familiarity and, um, and therefore sometimes people are able to come back or comfortable coming back on their own or with a family member or something like that. So thank you. So thank you, Hannah. So that was a little quick trip to the art museum. <laughs> we're having quite a little run around town. Now we're going to head over to the science museum, um, another very large institution with a lot of uh, great opportunities and great solutions. So um, take it away, Nora. Thank you. Um, I know this is very dense. There's a lot in here. But when uh, I was asked to talk about accessible exhibits, one of the things that occurred to me was that I wanted to talk about things beyond physical inclusion. Two of the things that we think about a lot at Museum of Science are cognitive inclusion and social inclusion. And this next slide is a photo of an older exhibition that was retrofitted to make it more physically accessible. It was, a, it was uh, inaccessible dioramas that were retrofitted with audio labels so that the text became available to visitors who were either blind or low vision, who were English language learners who couldn't read print for some other reason, or were beginning readers. Um, they added ambient background sounds from the habitats pictured in the dioramas to enhance the sensory experience. Scent boxes were added, and those are recharged weekly by our exhibit maintenance folks to sort of create the scents that are available in that particular environment. There are also tactile things that were added to illustrate the educational themes of the exhibit. And one of the things that was really uh, interesting is once all of this stuff was added to make the exhibit more accessible for people with disabilities, it became clear to the education and exhibit staff that all visitors were coming across coming away from the exhibit with a much greater understanding of the themes that the educators were trying to convey. And that's what we mean by cognitive inclusion. The next slide is probably a definition that you're all very familiar with, the definition of universal design. That's going to come up a lot when designing inclusive exhibits. The next slide is the principles of universal design, the idea of being that exhibits are created from the ground up with these principles in mind. The exhibit that you were shown a couple of slides ago is actually not an example of universal design in that it was retrofitted to include these features. So the goal is to start from the ground up. It's also a lot cheaper to incorporate <laughs> inclusion 
when you're beginning with nothing and weaving it into the entire exhibit from the get-go. It, be, it becomes more seamless, it's less expensive, it's more, it, it's just smoother for the visitor, for everybody. So when thinking about physical inclusion, you need to think about navigation to space, sensory issues, how much people can see and hear, can they stand. These are all aspects that you need to take into account when you're designing physically inclusive exhibits. The next one, sorry I'm tearing through these, I have way too many slides. <laughs> um, the next one is gets into co um, communication access, which is something else that you need to think about. Hannah hit on a lot of these different ways for visitors to access in a sensory way the content, whether it's large print or braille, audio recordings, having a staff person or a volunteer acting as a, an actual reader, providing content in electronic formats so that people can listen to it on their own, on their own devices, or in some cases we've had visitors get materials in electronic format so that they can read them on their own refreshable braille display. But that gives the visitor, by giving them the electronic format ahead of time, it gives them control over how they process the information. Sign language interpreters, CART, computer-aided real-time translation, captioning are all examples of providing communication access. The next slide gets into more details about different aspects of physical access. If you have an audio tour, think about offering transcripts of it. Um, inaccessible rooms in a building, a historic home, having photographs, having a video feed so that a visitor who can't physically get to that space can see what's being seen by visitors who can access that space. Written material can be provided in a variety of formats as we talked about earlier. Making sure that your website is accessible is of paramount importance, I think, because people really do check out websites before they visit. Nobody wants to go to a museum only to find out that they can't get into the bathroom or they can't participate in the activity. So a lot of people, particularly younger people with disabilities, plan and they use the internet to plan. So that's a great place to make sure that the information on what services, amenities, physical access you provide is available to the public. Um, make sure all of your videos are open captioned. And I was talking about that. Lighting makes an exhibit easier for everybody, easier, safer. Um, labeling exhibits with fonts that are easy to read, not crazy fonts. Don't put purple text on an orange background. Make sure that there's sufficient content contrast so that people can read. And I'm still carrying through all these slides. Now, the next one, what I was talking about before, cognitive inclusion. You may have heard of universal design. You may not have heard of universal design for learning. This is the definition of it in a broad way. To get a broad spectrum of learners, the universally designed curricula require a range of options for accessing, using, and engaging with the learning materials. Like universal design for architecture, these alternatives reduce barriers for individuals with disabilities and also enhance the opportunities for every learner. Um, this particular book, uh, and I know you'll have access to the slides, it's definitely worth looking at. Universal design for learning is incredibly important in how the exhibit designers at the museum create their exhibits, making sure that the content is accessible to as many people as possible because it's a center for informal science education and that's taken very seriously. Uh, the Universal Design for Learning recognizes, the, or these are the three main aspects of Universal Design for Learning and that's more from the same book that we were talking about earlier. Because we have to keep in mind that museums are places that are designed for people to learn. They're not just fun, we are teaching people. And unlike a lot of classrooms, museums offer a unique possibility for multi-sensory learning activities in a lot of ways that traditional classrooms and learning environments don't. And that's something that we can make great use of. Also, unlike a typical classroom structure, 
visitors at a museum can learn from each other, from conversations with one another, from observing others and how they interact with the exhibit. So it's a real social learning experience. And so when we're creating cognitive content, three main ideas, and this is throughout the entire exhibit, um, and when you're designing the different components of the entire exhibit, is to constantly repeat and reinforce the main ideas, give multiple entry points, ways to engage, whether it's tactile, visual, audio, everybody learns in a different way, and you can't convey the content of the exhibit to only one sense. The more senses you engage, the deeper the content takes root. And the physical and sensory access is clear. And then, again, why repeat and reinforce the main ideas? It's similar to what I was talking about before. People access things in different ways. People have different attention spans and short-term memory. People can relate to a disability or context in the situation. Sorry, I'm getting a little lost here. But the fact that it's multi-sensory and that people access the content in multiple different ways and have these multiple areas of engagement is critical to them getting the message that you're trying to get across with your exhibit. So when you're creating a, an entire exhibit, you explicitly focus and state the main idea, but then you break it down into the exhibit, into the more distinct pieces that all relate to the main idea. But be explicit about the breakdown and how the components relate to one another and relate back to the main idea. Assume different levels of content, knowledge, and personal experience of the visitors before they engage in the exhibits. Give visitors a wide range of options for understanding. And multiple examples provide visitors different ways that they can personally connect with the content. And so we're talking when we're talking about audiences connecting to a wide range of prior experiences, making the exhibits fun and engaging for all learners, using examples and non-examples to get people to engage with the content, but building in multiple layers into the program so that there isn't just one entry point. Then to get into social inclusion, uh, accessible exhibits even if they're physically accessible, aren't necessarily going to bring people into the museum if they don't feel welcome. Physical accessibility is only part of it. So outreach, making sure that your institution lets people with disabilities know that they are welcome, that these accessible features exist for them, is really important. Staff and volunteers are also a huge part of inclusion. If there's an accessible exhibit that's staffed, but the staff people don't know how to engage with visitors or how to convey what's accessible, it's really not going to make that connection with the visitor. So staff and volunteers need to be familiar with all of the accessible features, services, routes, just as you would expect them to be familiar with any other amenities available to visitors in the museum including visitors with disabilities in trainings for staff and volunteers. Help put staff and volunteers more at ease, less afraid of saying the wrong thing. And that constant engagement with visitors with disabilities makes people just realize that having people with disabilities at the museum is routine and perfectly normal and expected. And the great thing about that is that that then carries over to other visitors. When staff and volunteers are comfortable, that sends a message to visitors that, hey, if these visitors belong here. Everyone belongs here. And it sends a greater sort of social message. I know that people talk a lot about museums being institutions for social change and getting this message across that this is an integrated and welcoming environment spreads itself out to the other visitors. So you're not only educating visitors about the content of your exhibits, you're 
creating a sort of social message. And then the last slide is about institutional inclusion. And you have to have, we were talking about this earlier, you have to have institutional buy-in. So the institutional culture needs to include inclusive values and beliefs. One of the, actually the person who's head of the exhibits department at the Museum of Science has done extensive study, and particularly in her PhD thesis, about how to get the idea of inclusion institutionalized into the culture of a museum. And these are the different critical points that she came up with. Distributed knowledge and expertise in addition. No individual can do it alone. Responsibility needs to be shared among staff. Same thing that carries into distributed leadership. Collaboration within the organization as well as outside. Con uh, collaborating with the disability community, with other museums who've gone through what you're going through. You can learn a lot. Involvement of people with disabilities. My started. Yeah. <laughs> I'll read the last one. Okay. Perception of available funding. I think that's for the MCC. <laughs> oh, no. <and else. laughs> I've been asking our team, so what else could we be doing? And that, that little suggestion has come up. Um, we are going to have some time um, after our last presentation to have more conversation. And I do want to encourage people to type in any questions that you have on your computer. And Jen is collecting all those. And we'll go through the questions um, at the end of the presentation. So we'll have a lot more conversation and can pick up on where some of these um, wonderful presentations left off. But at this point, we're going to move over to Emily Curran from the Old South Meeting House. Thanks. Uh, as a smaller museum, I, I want to say we've really, really benefited from our colleagues in the museum field who have devoted such extensive time to thinking about how to make museum exhibits and programs more inclusive. And so I was especially happy to be here with colleagues from the MFA and the Museum of Science. They've both done so much work in this area over the course of many decades. Uh, I think we're all always in learning mode. We're never reaching the end of our quest to be as inclusive as possible. And we know we still have a far way to go. Um, at Old South Meeting House, we preserved a 1729 historic site. It's the place where the Boston Tea Party began. And this historic space, which is essentially really inside, it's one very large room with two balconies uh, that's 650 people. So uh, this is where our exhibits and our programs all take place. We have to think about access to our historic site, our exhibits, and programs all at once since they all coexist in this historic space. And uh, we were lucky to do a major renovation 18 years ago that enabled us to make our building ADA compliant accessible for visitors using wheelchairs, with accessible restrooms, an elevator connecting the different floors. And so we thought about accessibility extensively in designing our permanent exhibit at that time. But really, that was just the beginning. In the years since that time, we've continued to make changes in order to increase access. So. I feel like I'm talking from the perspective of a very small museum with a small staff and limited budget. And here's my advice for smaller institutions, uh, specifically thinking about exhibits, but for us it really involved everything. Um, first of all, as everybody I think is doing, keep access in mind throughout the design and all of your exhibits. And there's so many great resources for this. And I'll be providing links to some of those. Uh, many places have spent a great deal of time researching what is effective, and we have really benefited from that. And you can too, because the great part is museums are so collegial and sharing of their information. Um, we were able to include aspects that made a difference in our exhibit from the beginning. Uh, many of them have been talked about already, things like the height of exhibits, uh, readability of labels, audio programs with transcripts, braille transcriptions. But that, you don't stop there. That's just the beginning. 
I think perhaps the most important thing we can do to build an institutional culture of thinking about access and making sure that we are inclusive is including our visitors in the conversation and really making changes that improve our access for all people. And although many of us at smaller museums may have less resources, we certainly have less staff. We do have the advantage of being more nimble institutions. <laughs> so broadly speaking, there's a lot less levels to go through to make a change happen in a smaller museum. The idea of empowering your staff at all different levels and empowering your visitors to identify areas where people are not being included and making changes to improve that is something that may be far easier to do at our small institutions than it can be at larger museums. So my first piece of advice, and there you see in the image, that's our museum being used for a, uh, that's actually an environmental uh, debate about the environment that was part of a gubernatorial debate. Uh, but you can see how people are seated throughout, and along the back wall is our permanent exhibit, which is accessible during events as well. Um, so point number one, empower your staff at all different levels to think about how to improve access. A few examples, uh, almost all the examples we have, uh, so here's a, a girl who's doing a scavenger hunt. Uh, we have staff who saw a need and made changes. Scavenger hunts that explore the historic site and focus visitor attention on parts of the exhibit are geared for different levels. Uh, there are some that are much more pictorially based rather than relying on reading so that uh, these have worked brilliantly with student groups with varying learning abilities but have also proven to be very popular with regular museum visitors and we now have those out there for everybody. Large type exhibit guides Although we had Braille guides developed years ago, over the years these were less and less likely to be used and uh, changing or augmenting these with large print guides, we found these have been used by a broad range of people, not just visitors with low vision. A small change, we uh, included a claw for gripping quill pens during writing activity uh, that originally was for students who had some difficulty gripping pens, but these are now used by the general public at drop-in activities. Assistive listening devices for talks. Uh, the interesting thing is we, we were able to really invest in that because we found it was so helpful uh, for visitors, but it came about because of visitors making their needs known, which kind of leads to the next point. Um, I, I just wanted to also say another small, tiny change, but this results from having empowered staff. A staff person saying, hey, we need to leave these particular set of doors open so visitors in a wheelchair don't have to stop, open the door. It's, it's not as accessible as it could be with that door shut ensuring that the 36 inch wide passageway doesn't somehow get blocked with a succession of items. But having all of your staff involved with that. But the second point is empowering your visitors to let you know what they need and listening to them. Most of the changes, I would correct that, I'd say all of the changes we have made came about through a partnership of learning between us as staff and our visitors, and rather than being imposed top down, they kind of percolate bottom up. And so those frontline people and their interactions with visitors are really, really critical. At Old South Meeting House, two groups of visitors have been especially helpful in assisting us to improve our accessibility. Uh, many of our visitors are older, growing older and are experiencing changes in mobility, hearing, and vision, 
ensuring our exhibits and programs include them is very important. We also work very closely with school groups that include a range of learning abilities, uh, which has kept us learning about how best to include people on a number of different levels with different learning styles and needs. Our visitors have been very vocal at times about letting us know what makes a difference to them, and we are very, very grateful to them. It's, this can be challenging, uh, but building a culture of inclusion and customer service so that your frontline staff, rather than feeling attacked when a visitor expresses a need, sees that as an opportunity for us to improve how we are doing and a way for us to uh, think about that. Uh, it's how change comes about. Um, the visitors are truly our partners and our staff is really able to listen to them and then take action to develop or to develop a plan to take action. The other thing, uh, the last thing I want to leave you with is that it's never too late to make changes. Even if you've got a major exhibit considered finished, which is exactly what the Museum of Science had with that retrofitted exhibit, um, if you continue to look at your exhibits as being in a testing mode, you can get a great deal of usable information from seeing how exhibits work with your visitors that you will never get from good intentions or familiarity with standards and regulations. So if you haven't had much success in attracting a broad range of visitors with different abilities, you could also think about how to invite them in to help you test exhibits and see how well is this working. And I think the MCC has some resources in this area. Um, so these are just some suggested resources uh, just for you to know about. Um, the great with uh, Smithsonian guidelines for accessible exhibit design. I refer to these when I need to know, like, well, what point typeface is going to work well? What kind of typeface? Things like that. And the National Park has some great stuff, too. There's a good article on inclusive language that's helpful. It's not the be-all article, but it starts a conversation and a thinking about how do we say what we say. Great. That was fantastic. And actually, um, uh, we've already had a couple of questions come in, and I think we'll jump right into those right now. And the first one was for you, Hannah. Um, one of our listeners noticed that you talked about adhering to guidelines. And she wants to know, are these MFA guidelines or are these standard external guidelines? What were you referring to? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we do have our own guidelines, but they are the sources behind those guidelines are the ADA, the Smithsonian guidelines, um, and I feel like there's, um, and then some of them are from organizations like Lighthouse for the Blind that has some great resources on some of the things that Emily was just referring to. I'll also say that we're in the process, we're going to be reviewing ours. Um, so, so stay tuned. I'm happy to share, you know, the information and what I've learned. But actually, that just goes back to Emily's point about continually improving. You're never done. That's what we call the program up. It's a direction, not a destination, because we know we can always keep improving. The next question I think was really um, addressed to the MFA, but I think it's relevant to all of all of the organizations represented around the table. And it was, have you ever commissioned uh, a work of art, an installation, a program? designed specifically uh, by individuals with disabilities um, to take their unique perspective from the design, the program design and exhibit design um, point of view. Have you ever intentionally done that as part of accessibility? Well, we have, um, we do have different artists with disabilities included in our collection and one piece that's up right now in the contemporary wing um, is, I think, very much uh, an expression of that, except I'm spacing on the artist's name, but that maybe it will come to me before I finish. But in terms of a group of artists really um, thinking about disability and their experience, we have um, 
a partnership with the Perkins School for the Blind, and every year we have a group of teenagers come throughout the year to the museum. And um, one year, they and sometimes they make art and things like that. And um, one year, the group um, we were able to have an exhibition of their work, and it very much reflected. So I think part of the question was about our collection. So. Um, some of the work in, actually all of the work in the exhibit was um, in some way a reflection of their experience in the museum. And um, putting together the exhibition with them was um, really great experience for us because of course they wanted their work to be able to be touched and um, so we so it was. We set it up so that um, the pieces, there were some exceptions. There were some small sculptures that um, were under a bonnet except for certain times um, because it, they couldn't, we couldn't figure out a way where they wouldn't walk. And at certain times the bonnet would come off so people could touch them. But there was a lot of work on the walls that was um, people could touch all the time. And we also had an audio. So from their perspective, they wanted the artwork completely accessible at all times to people who are blind. Um, so also had braille labels and had them in kind of a consistent location, which is really important if you have braille labels because they're not really very useful if you can't, you can't find them. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's the one example I can give of, of a time. So, yeah. Nora? I can actually think of one. The, Several years ago, the Museum of Science sponsored a sort of design charrette that took place over the course of a week called Creating Museum Media for Everyone. It became clear that a lot that museums, particularly science museums, were adapting technology at a, a really rapid rate, and accessibility of that technology was not keeping up. We were a science museum that didn't have um, touch screens, for example. We didn't have them because they weren't accessible and we weren't going to ad adopt a technology that wasn't accessible. But visitors were coming in with an expectation of a certain level of technology. I mean, they're saying, my kid's speaking spell has a touch screen. <laughs> oh, you have touch screens. <laughs> and telling them it's because they're not accessible, it wasn't really resonating with a lot of the, <laughs> the general public. So the idea was to get exhibit designers, IT folks, people with disabilities, and also the people that created this type of technology, touch tables, um, different types of electronics together in one room to work on how to make these things accessible. What came out of it were um, accessible touch screens and accessible touch tables, some of which we have in the Museum of Science now. Another example of what came out of it was we were trying to figure out a way to convey data, particularly graphs, which can be incredibly difficult to convey to people who are blind or visually impaired, particularly not necessarily a line graph, but say a scatter plot. And we worked with a um, blind scientist who assisted in creating a what he called sonified graphing calculator for Texas Instruments so that uh, scientists who are blind now have access to graphing calculators. And he worked with us to develop and an exhibit that's now on the floor of the museum that measures the wind speed uh, of the wind outside as well as the energy being generated by five different uh, wind turbines that are up on our roof. And that is not only completely visually accessible, it's accessible in, in an audio way for visitors who are, are blind. And so throughout the museum, we definitely have things that are the direct result of these types of collaborations. Also, when exhibits are being developed and exhibit components are being prototyped, we have a pretty extensive database at this point of people who have various disabilities or family members with disabilities who've expressed an interest in coming in, working with the designers on the prototype exhibit and expressing their opinions as far as the universal design, the usability, the accessibility of the exhibit. So that's, that is actually folded into everything that is being worked on and hits the floor at the museum at this point. That conversation with 
visitors with users sounds like it's a really important, both evaluative tool, but also, um, as you were talking about, Emily, sparked a few changes. So how do you formalize that? How do you, both from, from encouraging visitors to feel comfortable uh, to describe um, shortcomings, perhaps, in their um, visit, and then from the other side, as you were talking about not being too defensive when you hear that, how do you, how do you have that formalized, Emily? I think um, I'd say we don't have it completely formalized, but I, I think um, in our case we've tried to include that training with everything that we do with our uh, frontline staff, so that uh, and all the staff who are working at programs and events and in the um, within the museum, so that you can do both things, both have that conversation, um, open up that conversation, but also be observing things. And, and really all our changes have come from this. And also empowering staff who are on the floor to identify stuff that's going on and then be part of the solution so that they can see that change happen. So we, we see that somebody uh, something's not working, or we can see that we have an audio program, but we need to have transcripts for people who cannot uh, hear that program. Um, and what has been the impact when you've made the changes on the staff? I think when the staff have been involved and they see that, and they see that, that in use, yeah, it's a great feeling because you know that you've made a difference. Um, also, I got. Um, I wish I could have brought a recording of this. I got a phone call from uh, somebody who just wanted to call me and tell me how great the staff had been. She had significant uh, issues with mobility and uh, remembering things, and uh, just a whole host of issues. And she just wanted to talk about how the staff had really been so supportive. And, and they had. They had been going over everything over and over and uh, just were there to talk with her and be able to have her participate in these activities that I think that in a lot of situations she would have been put off from being part of that. So. Which is really an example of everything doesn't necessarily have to be physically perfect and anticipate absolutely everything that can come in the door, but it's how the person is received and how welcome they are made to feel when they arrive and how the staff works with them to make sure that they can have a good experience. Hannah, um, before we started the webinar, um, we were having a little bit of a conversation about is everything going to be for everybody and how you think about that. Can we make all of our exhibits accessible to everybody? Um, yeah, so I was saying that I don't believe that there's any um, exhibition that is really going to work for 100% of the people that can walk um, or come or roll through the doors. And, um, and so I see it as part of, and the reason that I think that is based on experience, um, that I know that some of our visitors who come to the museum regularly say, you know, with low vision, cannot tolerate bright light, and then another visitor can actually only use the vision that they have if the light is bright. So I mean, there's just one simple example of how a space is not going to work for those two visitors at the same time. So I see it as part of my job to think about um, who a space is not working for and what might we do about that either, which could be what Emily and Anita, you were just talking about, about what, what role does the staff play? Um, I don't know, there are any number of ways that it could be approached um, depending on the situation. But We have just about two minutes left. Um, and so before we sign off, um, I did want to uh, remind everybody, first of all, thank our wonderful panel here. Um, 
uh, Hannah Goodwin from the Museum of Fine Arts, Nora Nagel from the Museum of Science, and Emily Kern from the Old South Meeting House. And um, please, um, I'm sure they would welcome any emails or questions that you might have. If you think of them later, I usually think of them after the webinar is over and say, darn, I wish I would have asked that. So uh, they are very accessible people <laughs> in every respect. So you can be absolutely um, feel confident that you can go ahead and um, uh, give them a call or seek their advice because they truly are our local experts on uh, this whole topic. Um, as you know, we are just uh, getting through our first year of the UP program and we are going to have a second year. We called the first first meeting we were going to have a second year. So uh, the guidelines and applications will be coming up together this summer. Um, stay tuned for that. We hope we'll be able to be providing some enhancements to the program budget permitting and we are interested from finding out what the MCC budget is going to be and everybody I suspect on the phone is um, anxiously awaiting that and I thank you all for your advocacy. Um, we're cautiously optimistic around our budget this year. Um, we'll make sure that all of you who are on the webinar, uh, whether you're in the UP program and the um, uh, Innovative Learning Network um, or not, uh, you'll be included on all of our uh, emails, notices. Uh, we'll let you know about any workshops and any other webinars and events that we're going to be having about this topic. And we'd also really appreciate some feedback from you on how uh, you felt about this webinar. Uh, there's a survey that uh, you'll be receiving and we would greatly appreciate it if you'd take the time to fill it out. Um, this is an aspirational program. There is no such thing as perfect for everybody as Hannah so clearly articulated. Um, but we all think we can continually improve and do better and we want to do it together and we're all learning together. So I want to thank you for your interest and enthusiasm in being as accessible as you possibly can be and thank you for spending an hour with us today. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>